Hi folks, Sue Staniforth here. We've had a great uh, number of people interested in this webinar. So we're just, I'm seeing lots of people entering the, our, our, um, our, our webinar today. So I'm just gonna give people another minute or so to, uh, to get going and get settled. All right, great. Well, thanks to you all once again for joining us for today's webinar, Balancing Tourism, Angling and Invasive Fish Species in BC. BC is a popular angling hotspot and it attracts recreational tourists from the province and beyond. We're so lucky here, we have over 20,000 lakes and over 750,000 kilometers of streams. Our native sports species, specifically salmon and trout, attract anglers from around the world. However, invasive sp fish species such as bass have ended up in some of BC's fishing spots. And these are also attracting sport anglers. This webinar will discuss the increasing popularity of some invasive fish for angling and the related impacts on native species that they're having. So at this point, I'm pleased to give a warm welcome and introduction to Jillian Steele. She's joining us today from North Vancouver. Jill is an avid angler who has encountered many invasive species and their spread throughout the province. She is a director of the Steelhead Society of British Columbia, whose mandate is protecting wild steelhead populations and their river systems in our province. Jill is also one of the founders of the BC Women's Fly Fishing Group, promoting the networking of female fly fishers in BC and providing educational content for its members. As a first year student in the Fish, Wildlife and Recreation Program at BCIT, Jill is exploring the world of resource management and the delicate intricacies of human intervention in local ecosystems and its extending impacts. Great to have you, Jillian. At this point, I'll pass the microphone over to you. I hope everybody enjoys the webinar. Thanks so much, Sue, and I'm really looking forward to this and I appreciate everything and everyone who has come to join us on this Wednesday afternoon. And I really look forward to having this conversation. So without further ado, I will share my presentation. All right, so just hoping that everyone can see that before we get started. And yep. we can see everything great. Thanks, Joe. Perfect. So. Hello and welcome to everyone and thank you for taking the time out of your Wednesday afternoon uh, to join me here and a huge thank you to the Invasive Species Council for giving me this forum to uh, talk about this issue and for inviting me on here to really elaborate on what our future relationship with invasive species uh, in BC is going to look like. My name is Jill, as I've been introduced, and I'm here to talk to you about how we can balance tourism, angling, and invasive fish species within British Columbia. So, oops. So, a message for everybody, and a message coming from an angler like myself. We live in British Columbia and we are here in an angler's paradise. It's a wild west of adventure and opportunity that's, some of, that's home to some of arguably the world's best sport fish and amazing ecological diversity. British Columbia's native fish stocks are at threat from numerous risks, including climate change, climate change habit, habitat degradation, pollution and overfishing. However, threat that's always been here and been on the back burner for a long time is flaming up and adding a new level of pressure to an already delicate system, and that's invasive fish. Invasive fish species are nothing new to British Columbia. However, their spread is becoming increasingly tied to their popularity as a sport species, and our future relationship with invasive game fish is a precarious one. So a little bit about what I'm gonna be talking about today and where we're gonna go through on this conversation. We're gonna look at BC and tourism as a general overview. We're gonna discuss invasive fish in British Columbia and what that looks like. Next, we're gonna talk about how they arrived and also why they've been here or come here. I'm gonna investigate a couple top problems, including some case studies on issues that are 
very prevalent and very prominent right now. We're going to look at invasive fish versus introduced fish and how those differ and why there's an important um, distinguishing features about them. We're going to look at sport fishing tourism and exotic species, what the long term impacts are, the scale of management that already exists in British Columbia, and finally, what can be done and moving forward with this relationship with invasive game fish in BC. So a little bit about myself and just so you can understand kind of where my take on this issue is coming from and kind of what my perspective is. I come from an angler background as well as working within the sport fishing industry in BC on many different levels. I currently work for my dad at our family owned tackle store in North Vancouver and have done so since I was about 15 years old. I volunteered with uh, various uh, groups and organizations throughout my time in the industry, including volunteering my time uh, to hatcheries or cleanups and just making sure I'm kind of giving back in some way. I'm currently at BCIT uh, enrolled in the fish wildlife and recreation program and I'm looking forward to a career in wildlife and fisheries management, uh, hopefully within the province. I also um, am a co-founder of the BC Women's Fly Fishing Group, which uh, aims to promote women's fly fishing um, and in the outdoor space in BC. So I am coming to you from an angler background and hoping to kind of share my points on this issue uh, specifically. So BC and tourism, obviously British Columbia is an angler's paradise. And we have so much that is available to us here from extremely remote places to places that are very accessible for all ages or user groups. We have saltwater fisheries, freshwater fisheries, and it really has something for everyone. Everybody that's here knows the pristine beauty and diversity that makes British Columbia so unique. And it is truly a remarkable angling destination specifically. With over 20,000 lakes and 750,000 kilometers of river, there's really no end in sight as to the possibilities that exist here. Sport fishing in British Columbia is estimated as a $1.1 billion industry. And this is a massive economic driver to BC and to what makes us British Columbians as well. Freshwater fishing uh, specifically estimates that roughly it has over 350,000 participants and anglers per year getting um, involved in the uh, freshwater fishery. So this is a huge recreational opportunity for a lot of people. A lot of people within British Columbia partake in fishing and it is something that is really key to how we identify as British Columbians. Non-resident, so non-British uh, Columbian, Canadian or international anglers make up roughly 20% of anglers in British Columbia on a given year. So a solid portion of anglers come from outside the province. And this is adding to that massive tourism driver that we have here. And it really creates this big influx of uh, revenues from international tourism coming specifically for BC's fisheries. People travel from around the world to pursue British Columbia's native species, including species of note such as salmon or steelhead and trout in both salt and freshwater opportunities. There's also very unique species such as the white sturgeon that you can see in this photo, which draw people from around the world. BC's tourism industry is based on outdoor recreating from fishing to hunting, skiing and surfing. Our identity as British Columbians as is in the outdoors. Wilderness tourism as an overall overarching um, driver contributes roughly $17 billion to BC. So outdoor tourism and wilderness tourism is a huge driver here in our province. And it helps to keep our province very, very prosperous and a reason why we all love to live here. So native fish in British Columbia uh, they've been here for a while and we have a number of um, invasive species here that don't just include fish. Uh, fish, or sorry, um, invasive species include um, vegetation, uh, arthropods and amphibians that have all been brought here in different means. In British Columbia, there's roughly 30 species of invasive fish 
that are recognized currently here. And every year we're starting to see more species that um, have shown up or more species that are potentially becoming a risk. Uh, a quick little note um, and a little reminder for anybody, an invasive species is considered a non-native species that causes harm to the environment, the economy, and society. These are species that have a tendency to establish quickly and outcompete native species, as well as posing a threat uh, to juvenile native species, and in many cases, salmonids here in BC. They can also pose a threat to um, amphibians or other uh, smaller animals, such as small mammals as well. Uh, invasive species often increase their populations rapidly and have different life histories, such as multiple spawning, that are different from the native species. So they're starting to intercept or uh, become prevalent in different niches that aren't necessarily um, uh, something that is characteristic of native populations. They can occupy places very, very rapidly and can be difficult uh, to get rid of because of their quick establishing and quick dispersal into some of these waterways. Invasive fish can be extremely costly to remove once they get into a system uh, because it's difficult to track and difficult to eliminate completely. You also run the risk of killing an entire system if you wish to get rid of um, an invasive fish and look to completely kill off that system just for the sake of removing that one species. Invasive fish can also pose other environmental issues and can introduce disease uh, to native populations. And finally, they can pose harm to commercial fisheries, such as our commercial salmon fishery here, if this problem becomes too prevalent in the future. So for the purpose of this discussion, I'm going to be focusing on the invasive fish species here in British Columbia that are becoming increasingly prolific due to their popularity as a sport species. There are many invasive populations here of fish, but what I'm going to focus on is the populations that have been introduced as game species and are here as an intended fisheries development. So they are coming at the cost of our existing species and potentially diversity and can ultimately harm an extremely valuable tourism driver and impact the uh, ecological balance that already exists here. So invasive fish in British Columbia, they often get brought here through two different means and it's not exclusive to these two different means but in broad strokes, we can look at invasive fish coming here through intentional or unintentional release. And intent, unintentional release would look at boat bilges, trailers, recreational watercraft, using live fish as bait, ballast from ships. These are all examples of how fish can accidentally be brought into waterways here. Most recently, and I'm sure that many of you saw um, in the last few weeks, the very prolific quagga or ze zebra mussels that have slowly been making their way across North America were just found in Terrace. This is extremely pro problematic and a really scary reality that we're beginning to face with a lot of these invasive species. The other way that invasive species get here is intentional. So this can look like aquarium release, flushing, you know, the pet goes down the toilet, unfortunately. Um, and although people might not think of this as being something that can harm or maybe the fish can die, this is something that is very, very problematic. The other reason um, an intentional way that we see dispersal invasive fish is by sport release. So people releasing them intentionally into waterways to become fisheries and to become something that people can target there in the future. And whether that's for kids because they're easy or because of their popularity elsewhere, this is something that is really of great concern um, and the focus of what I'm gonna talk about today. So I'm gonna look at a couple species specifically and we're gonna focus on some of the top problems here in British Columbia and probably the most obvious and one that people are most familiar with is the largemouth bass. Now I have targeted these species and I have fished for these guys in the lower mainland in many places and I'm very familiar with these guys as being a fun sport species but also being uh, something that is very very problematic. So largemouth bass 
has a massive following in the United States and is probably one of the most popular fish that we uh, that is kind of promoted down in the south as well. They live in warm water or can live in low oxygen systems, marshes, backwaters, ditches, and largemouth bass can also spawn multiple times. They're aggressive and very predatory, which is what makes them a popular sport fish in the United States. You've probably seen bass masters. Uh, they're popular on the fly with conventional gear. So there's lots of opportunities and they're very prevalent throughout the United States. Currently, largemouth bass is being managed by the provincial government in the sense that they're already here and the focus is just on keeping numbers low and understanding that they're established and that they're very prolific in a lot of our waterways. And it's just a matter of preventing the further spread of these guys. So a case study I'm gonna look at specifically on uh, the largemouth bass is uh, the Pitt Addington Marsh or the Pitt Polder area. Now, this is a very important wetland habitat and it is a rare reverse delta and it's crucial ha spawning habitat for salmon and steelhead. And if you're not sure about the location of the Pitt um, Addington Marsh or Pitt Polder Reserve, it's right at the base of Pitt Lake across from Widgeon Creek and just on the other side, on the boundary of kind of Port Coquitlam and uh, Maple Ridge. So, this area is a very uh, special area. It's home to over 200 birds and mammal species and it's crucial um, spawning habitat or rearing habitat for juvenile salmonids. There's also a number of rare plant species that are found in this area, including the pointed broom sedge and two-edged water starwort. And it is connected to the Pitt and Fraser River directly, which creates future um, uncertainty with how many of these invasive species are going to react. So the reason I'm talking about this is because bass are very prevalent in this waterway and it has become quite a destination for bass anglers uh, in the lower mainland because of its dike system, its easy accessibility, it's a large area. In the summertime, it tends to grow up with a lots of weeds and becomes a very um, key habitat for uh, not only juvenile salmonids, but other invasive species such as bass or carp as well. So this has become a very popular fishing destination for bass anglers that is, um, that has just escalated over the last couple of years. And a lot of people go here to target these species and it isn't always necessarily understood that even though it doesn't seem like much, it is a very, very important habitat for uh, native species in uh, British Columbia specifically. But as a destination, anglers are going here to target largemouth bass specifically, as well as crappie and some other species too. So this is uh, the provincial PDF on largemouth bass. And it just goes over a couple of, um, the little pointers on bass uh, specifically and what they look like and how they've arrived. You can see in the top right corner here, the dispersal of bass throughout British Columbia. There's a large focus on the lower mainland, but you can see they actually sweep right across the southern part of the province and on Vancouver Island. So they are here right across BC and it's actually quite um, a bit of area that they do cover and not too far north. So mostly in the southern portion in those kind of warmer water conditions. But we can see that they are here and in many different regions of British Columbia specifically. So the second one we're going to look at is the cousin to the largemouth bass, of course, the smallmouth bass. Now, this is another major sport species in the United States and a little bit of a difference with largemouth and smallmouth other than what they look like and um, where they're located is smallmouth can also live in a very diverse range of environments and they can tend to do a little bit better in some colder climates as well as favor or withstand current more than largemouth can. So these guys can be increasingly scary as they might uh, see opportunity to move into alternative waterways that largemouth might not necessarily take on. So this becomes very much a scary reality for some of our larger systems or waterways where they can move into and actually tend to survive or flourish a little bit better than largemouth can. 
Smallmouth bass are also extremely aggressive and very predatory, spawning multiple times and becoming very protective of their nests. So these guys are voracious eaters and hunters. And unlike salmon, they don't have a cycle where they die after spawning. So because they can spawn multiple times, they can increase in an area and establish very, very quickly. Smallmouth bass can also carry parasites uh, that can be harmful to uh, native populations. And the other thing is that they don't just eat other fish. These guys can be a potential threat to amphibian species, such as frogs or newts or salamanders, and can cause harm to um, uh, sorry, native species, but not just native fish species. So smallmouth bass are also under the management of uh, the provincial government, making sure or trying to reduce the spread of these fish uh, into waterways where they have yet to be seen. So the case study I'm going to look at for smallmouth bass is Cultus Lake. And Cultus Lake, uh, just outside of Chilliwack there, is unique because it has two native Sara, Sara being species at risk, uh, species within the lake itself. So the Cultus Lake sockeye, which is considered endangered, and the Cultus Lake pygmy sculpin, which is only found in Cultus Lake, is considered threatened. And both these populations are extreme risk to a prolific um, expansion of smallmouth bass. So in very sensitive um, areas or populations that are increasingly um, sensitive, you're adding a new level of harm to them potentially with the um, expansion and establishment of smallmouth bass. Cultus Lake is a heavy recreational area with people traveling there in the summer for boating and fishing and camping and the smallmouth bass fishery there is really catching on and becoming quite a popular destination fishery for people in the lower mainland. The worry of course with Cultus Lake is that it's connected to the Chilliwack River which is also connected to the Fraser River and this is another fishery that is increasingly scary because of its connections and connection specifically to the Fraser River. So with all these fish species that we have uh, running through an introduction of a species such as smallmouth bass, which can survive and can be prevalent um, in these faster current or colder water scenarios is something that has a potential to be very harmful. In both cases with the pit polder for the largemouth bass and Cultus Lake for the smallmouth bass, it's these waterway connections and these unforeseen possible threats that pose kind of the biggest fear for some of our native species. So once again, just the provincial document on smallmouth bass specifically, you can see their distribution is not quite as heavy as the largemouth bass, but they do extend much farther north. There's also a very heavy prevalence of smallmouth bass on Vancouver Island. And increasingly, we're starting to see these guys showing up in uh, some other places across the province. So a lot of um, expansion for these guys and hopefully people start to realize that uh, it's not good to have these guys around because they are very aggressive, but it does make them a good game species and that's why people love them. So a couple other invasive um, fish that can be, maybe you don't think about them as being necessarily as problematic, but they are still here and they are causing their own issues. So this includes uh, the pumpkin seed, the black crappie, which are also very voracious eaters and pose a risk to juvenile salmonids, yellow perch, walleye, uh, brown bullhead catfish, and carp. And carp is interesting because they were brought in in many cases to control algae populations. However, they have spread very, very rapidly. Uh, many of these invasive species um, are brought in because they provide easy fisheries, especially for kids. And they do proliferate quickly, but they have a lot of benefits that people think provide these easy fisheries without necessarily thinking about the impacts that they have. So these fish might be good fighters or they make good pan fish and high catch rates for kids. Uh, and because they survive in low oxygen or poor environments, uh, they people think that they might not pose a threat because nothing else lives there. However, a lot of these areas, um, such as ponds or ditches, might be home to juvenile fish of other native species, and they can be actually very detrimental if 
uh, species like crappie or basket into these um, waterways. So just a couple of other um, kind of common uh, sport species that we see and species that uh, people are starting to release for the intention of creating fisheries. So the case study that I'm going to look at uh, when it comes to some of these greater um, species ranges uh, is the Columbia River. Now the Columbia is home to 43 species of fish, 27 are native and 16 are introduced. There's more introduced species here than anywhere else in British Columbia. And this could be part and parcel to the fact that the Columbia is unique in that it shares a border in Canada with the US. And this is where we start to see the problem with invasive species and the distinguishing uh, boundaries that we have politically, but don't necessarily extend to uh, fish species in these waterways. So as we move forward with invasive species management, we have to start thinking about this no longer on a uh, territorial scale in the sense that political boundaries drawn in a map, but starting to look at this from a, re a regional or a global scale. In many cases, what happens in Canada, especially for the case of the Columbia, will ultimately affect what happens in the United States. And that goes both ways. Of course, how the US manages their invasive species is going to affect how we manage or what impacts we see up here in Canada. As climate change and other ecological and environmental issues become more pressing, we're gonna to start to see this kind of discussion between a regional or global scale for dealing with these issues as opposed to just political. So climate change is going to be a very pressing issue for a lot of these species. And this leads to larger concerns of species management um, as it's just no longer a country issue. So we have to think about what the invasive species repercussions are here and how to handle these. So obviously the Columbia transcends two countries and multiple states. How each of those states handle their invasive species might differ versus how Canada and the US differs. So this is a huge region and a huge watershed that is much greater than what we might think of in terms of just localized uh, invasive species management. So thinking about this from an ecological approach that's not bound by political boundaries is going to be the way forward, I think, on how we're going to have to start to think about invasive game fish, especially. And that comes part um, as well with the education of anglers in the future, which I'll talk about in a minute, too. So the Columbia, a lot of people travel to the Columbia because of some of their invasive fish, including the walleye that uh, you can see here, which you can't find in many other places in British Columbia as well. So another thing that I'm going to talk to uh, talk to you all about as well is invasive versus introduced, because that is a conversation um, that has come up and something that people might not necessarily think about, but is uh, another thing to consider when we're talking about some of these species. So certain species within British Columbia have been introduced as a sport species and to allow and are chosen because of certain attributes. In many cases, uh, these species might not impact native species at all or might not impact them as uh, heavily as other game fish species or they're sterile and are introduced um, in closed circuit um, waterways. These um, species in some cases are raised and stocked here and they're very, very heavily managed to make sure that they don't uh, negatively impact wild populations. So we're gonna talk about uh, a couple of popular species here that are big draws uh, within British Columbia. So the first one I'm going to talk to you about is the brown trout. Now, the brown trout is not native to British Columbia, but was introduced back in the early 30s to actually create a fishery. And the Fisheries Research Board of Canada uh, notes that they were introduced into British Columbia in 1932, 1933, and 1934 from Wisconsin and Montana as eggs purchased by the Dominion Department of Fisheries in Canada. The eggs were actually placed in hatcheries on 
Cowichan uh, Lake and Qualicum Beach, and were introduced as fry fingerlings and yearlings into the Cowichan and Little Qualicum rivers on Vancouver Islands in the attempt to provide a fish for summer angling. So this species was specifically brought in to create a fishery on Vancouver Island. And they uh, have come forward and become very, very popular and something that people look for and travel for directly to target. On Vancouver Island, uh, they're found not only in the Cowichan and Qualicum, but also in the Adam and the Eve River as well. And on the mainland here, they can still be found in uh, small populations on the Kettle and even the Samokamine. Brown trout like cool, clear, well oxygenated streams and lakes, much like many of our anadromous fish here. Um, and they can be both anadromous and resident, although in the Cowichan, many of them take up as resident specifically. There's a little bit of competing uh, information with whether they compete directly with native salmonids. Uh, they, it has been found that they can um, compete directly with coho for spawning grounds and for food. However, it is thought that their populations aren't actually large enough to negatively impact salmon or steelhead uh, in the Cowichan specifically. And uh, the studies that I looked at said that they might compete a little bit, but they don't compete enough and they've been established long enough to show that they're not necessarily harming uh, some of our native populations as much as other invasive um, game fish species. So brown trout are um, a large draw, especially on the Cowichan, and uh, many people travel to Vancouver Island specifically to target these species. And many people might not have the option to travel back east or travel to the United States uh, to go and target this species. So it provides a fishery and it kind of an exotic species or a bucket list species that people can knock off their list without necessarily having to travel a great distance. And uh, as an angler, they're simply beautiful and something that's quite unique in, um, in uh, the Cowichan Valley over there. So a fish that people really love and people look forward to targeting. So, whoops. The other species that um, we see in British Columbia as an introduced species is the brook trout. Now, these guys are actually native to Canada and come from an Ontario origin, but they're not native to British Columbia. And brook trout have been in uh, British Columbia for over a century. Uh, the first kind of documented uh, introductions uh, date back to 1908. So they have been here for quite a while. Presently, they are stocked um, as non-reproductive non females or triploids and are sterile, um, being stocked only as females, um, and so they're not in a breeding capacity here. Uh, they're stocked in BC lakes specifically because they tend to do very well in a greater range of uh, conditions, and they tend to handle greater um, temperature ranges than rainbow trout do. So they do better in the summertime during warmer temperatures and also in colder temperatures as well than some of our native rainbow trout species. They can also handle a little bit of a wider variety of acidity as well, which makes them a good candidate for some of the interior lakes uh, within the province. Brown trout are also um, a very adaptable species. So they eat a wide variety of things from other fish to bugs and uh, can be supported in populations or sorry, can be supported in lakes that maybe have shiner problems or lakes where um, they need a, a fish eating species in there. They are created for fisheries and are found throughout British Columbia and they are stocked and raised by the Freshwater Fisheries Society of British Columbia. So even though they're not native, they are um, selected for specifically for a lot of their traits, which make them a good fisheries opportunity. They're also very good table fare and they're very good fighting fish as well. And I've had the uh, opportunity to chase these guys um, on a couple different lakes in the province and they are a lot of fun, I can say that for sure. So what does invasive angling tourism in British Columbia look like? And what does that mean when I say that? So people travel uh, to other regions to target species similar to how they do uh, in British Columbia or how people come to target our native species. People will travel throughout the province or come from other places to target species specifically 
um, for, you know, maybe their exotic lure or because they are uh, a non-native sport species. So bass fishing in the Okanagan has been present for years and is very prolific. There's an entire culture that surrounds it. There's guiding outfits. Um, there's a very big um, tourist draw and popular um, fisheries for these uh, species specifically. So largemouth and smallmouth bass. It's a very popular summer destination and in many cases where other fisheries uh, might start to diminish a little bit such as lake fisheries for rainbow trout um, where it gets too warm, bass fishing can uh, be very very popular. Brook trout, as I just spoke about, are another uh, species that people will travel for. Uh, brook trout are also uh, not just popular as a lake fish um, in spring, but also as an ice fishery as well. And many people will select uh, lakes specifically for ice fishing because they have brook trout, which can be very active once again in those colder temperatures. So people traveling and looking for these very specific fisheries and targeting those fisheries because of the fish that are there, not just because um, it's a native species, but because they can go and find this alternative fishery. Panfish, um, such as crappie and pumpkin seed, people might um, seek out lakes specifically for those because they're easy to target and easy to catch. Carp is another fishery that is getting a lot of draw uh, from fly anglers or from conventional anglers. They can be a challenging fish and for many people that might be a, um, a bucket list species as well. People also traveling to Vancouver Island for brown trout, as I said, on the Cowichan, or also um, for some of the bass fisheries over there as well. Uh, Elk Lake and Thetis Lake actually have fishing derby surrounding bass, and people might travel to those areas uh, to target some of those species that they can't find locally. So for people in the city, these are all draws and tourism drivers for residents within British Columbia and as well as elsewhere. With uh, COVID as well, and people not being able to travel outside the province or outside the country, all of a sudden there's a draw for some of these more unique fisheries and some of these places that um, require a little bit more exploring or something that anglers might not have done before. So there's quite a large draw for people to kind of explore some of these um, exotic or invasive species fisheries from outside their local region. So what are kind of the long-term impacts of that other than kind of the obvious? So of course, invasive species are gonna pose a serious threat to native fish populations, and they can harm a lot of our native tourism industries if those uh, native species are harmed or no longer available. As we move forward and as climate change is becoming more of a prevalent problem, what does this mean for the future? Many of these exotic species that I've discussed, such as bass or crappie or carp, they can survive or flourish in warmer water conditions. As climate change becomes more real and as it becomes something that we are dealing with on a more regular basis, um, is the likelihood of these species establishing um, quicker or more successfully, is this something that we have to look for in the future? Our native species are already at risk from various other things, including fish farms, pressure, changing ocean conditions, logging, and adding this um, other impact into the mix is something that we might not be able to account for until it's too late. Invasive fish species are extremely expensive to remove, and for many districts or areas, this might not be something that is possible or even uh, something that is tangible with the cost that's associated with it. There's also additional impacts that might not be foreseen or issues that haven't been realized yet. This is a picture of a uh, Minicata Regional Park, which is just outside of Maple Ridge, kind of Port Coquitlam as well. This used to be open to angling and was a popular place um, for anglers to go and target bass or crappie or pumpkin seed. And this area was closed in 2017 to angling as a means to protect the, West, the Western Painted Turtle. Uh, there was an issue where they were founding some um, fishing gear, such as plastics or garbage, being a concern for the turtle species. So invasive species also 
bring in a lot of other challenges that we might not see. Um, for bass especially, there's a lot of plastics that um, are being used and fished with or um, non-biodegradable baits. And the garbage or the plastics getting into these systems are something that might not be a direct threat or something that we see initially, but can pose harm to amphibians such as the turtle um, or other species as well. So there's all these other unforeseen problems too that aren't the obvious, you know, invasive species eating juvenile native species. There's a lot of other things that have to come into account when we start to think about these fisheries becoming more and more prevalent in the future. So just a little bit um, going back, I touched on it a bit, the BC invasive management scale and how the province of British Columbia kind of looks at some of these different species. And this is important because it talks to how they're being dealt with, but also maybe how we consider moving forward with these species in the future. So species that are considered under the management scale um, are species that are more widespread, um, but may it be of concern in specific situations with higher values, um, maybe um, conservation lands, agricultural crops, or the um, sorry, where the objective is to reduce the invasive species impacts locally or regionally where those resources are available. So the idea is that they have established, they're already here, it's just managing those existing populations. Examples of this would be crappie, carp, bass, pumpkin seed, a lot of the ones that I've discussed and talked about, those are under a management scale. So they're here, we know they're here, let's prevent them from kind of continuing forward. The next is the regional containment and control uh, scale, which are species that are high risk and well established or medium risk with high potential for spread. And the management objective here is to prevent further expansion into new areas and um, establish those control lines and prevent those species from getting beyond those control. Uh, an example of this right now would be the goldfish. And there's a big problem with those up in Dragon Lake in um, Quinell, and just making sure that those species don't get outside of those containment lines. Uh, the next um, scale is the provincial early detection rapid response. Um, species that are under this classification are high risk to British Columbia and the management objective currently is eradication. Uh, an example of this is the picture of this little guy on the screen, which is the oriental weather fish. And this photo was provided by a good friend of mine out in the field. And these guys are becoming um, a little bit more um, prevalent and they're starting to show up in areas. And this is a very scary species um, that can be extremely problematic if it establishes. So the goal right now is to get rid of every single one of these little weather fish as possible before they have the opportunity to get into and really do some serious damage to our local waterways. And finally, species that are under the uh, prevent scale are determined to be high risk and not yet established. And the management objective here is to prevent the introduction of these species. So at this point in time, various catfish species, some of the um, Asian carp species specifically, and the snakehead. Now, a snakehead was found a couple years ago um, over in Burnaby there, and they really do not want those guys getting out and becoming um, established here. So that's kind of the scale and understanding how the province is looking at and interacting with these species specifically. So the purpose of this is to kind of allocate efforts into controlling populations where they already exist and preventing the arrival and distribution of new species. So depending on the current regionality of these species, there's a very um, a variety of management considerations to be made with how we approach um, these species specifically. So what does the future look like? And what is going to be our ongoing relationship with many of these invasive species? So do we promote these fisheries and work on a system of management? Do we continue to let these populations flourish where they're already established? Or do we work towards removal and work to restoring some of these areas? Or is that even a possibility? We can help prevent the spread of these species with 
programs and education for anglers, uh, the angling community, for uh, local fishermen or fisher people? And do we just accept that they're here or do we look towards um, providing change and creating a, a conversation about what the movement forward is? For many of these species, they're here, they're established, it's almost impossible to get rid of them. There's management systems in place and looking at the balance between maintaining these populations and preventing, or sorry, managing these populations and preventing them from spreading while also still allowing for these fisheries is something that is going to come into play as we move forward in time. So do these populations directly harm tourism overall or do they create new tourism opportunities? It's very difficult to look at what the added value of the tourism is from these species because people are traveling and people are looking for new uh, ways to um, expand their fisheries opportunities. However, it also comes at a cost potentially of our native species. So looking at this balance and looking at this kind of opposite side of the coin is going to become very important, but also is very difficult to kind of value. Once again, with COVID and uh, a limited ability to travel, people are going to start to explore different regions of BC and look for different opportunities. So there is a bit of a tourism that is created here for these invasive species and for certain fisheries um, specifically, but how those compare and contrast to what harm is being done is really what needs to be looked at. So essentially at what cost? Uh, do we start to think about um, full removal in areas where it is possible? Is that even something that is going to be worthwhile? Uh, is it going to get worse? Uh, do we need to look at the rate of spread in some of those species? And do we need to look at how this is going to impact um, in the long run, if we have temperature changes, if we have environmental condition changes. Uh, do we look at heavier fines for people that are caught introducing these species into places? Personally, I would say yes, but do is this something that can be tracked? How much do we actually know about people that are introducing these species into waterways? And how can it be proven if there's all these connections between these different fisheries? And finally, how do we estimate the harm this has on tourism if it's driving that alternative tourism? So invasive species angling can never replace obviously um, native species tourism, but there's no doubt that there is a full community of anglers and a full um, tourism driver behind this at some point. So there's a lot of things that need to be thought about, but also um, just putting this into the conversation between the angling community, I think is really important for our future relationship with a lot of these species. So our role as uh, anglers and native species advocates. Now, I will be the first to admit I have fished for many invasive species here in British Columbia, and it does tear up my heartstrings a little bit because I'm the first one to say I love uh, our British Columbian species, especially salmon and steelhead, you know, and I understand and realize the threat that these invasive species um, do pose. But what is this going to look for or look like in the future? Uh, bass fishing specifically in the lower mainland um, is more prevalent than it was five years ago, is more prevalent than it was 10 years ago. And bass fishing gear is sold in almost every tackle shop in the lower mainland now, and it isn't going away anytime soon. Uh, the shops and the angling community is going to adapt and uh, provide for what is popular in that moment. So it's hard to tell a shop not to uh, sell a lot of this gear because that's what people are asking for. That's what people are looking to do. It's hard to just shut down and, you know, completely deny that fishery when it's already here and when people are doing it. Uh, are the shops part of the problem by selling the gear and proliferating the prevalence of these invasive species? That's a hard question to ask because they're just responding to the fishery and the demand at the time. Once again, many of these invasive species are here and established and are being promoted locally throughout the industry. 
guiding operations exist and will continue to adapt to the fisheries throughout the province. And people still have to make a living and people are utilizing this as a way to uh, generate income. So it's a little bit of a, of a hard uh, double-edged sword in some ways because of the harm that it can be doing, but also uh, because of the, the demand that is there and the tourism that it does drive. Now, many invasive species anglers or exotic um, species uh, uh, pursuists um, might not know or understand the long-term impacts. So it might seem harmless for targeting these fish species or introducing them, but there has to be a conversation about what this is gonna look like and what harm can be done. So getting that conversation out into the world about um, just the education about what this is going to look like and what essentially the uh, the future is going to be if this is not controlled or if this keeps um, becoming more and more prevalent throughout time. There is a bit of a concern um, about uh, new um, invasive uh, uh, introductions not being reported. Uh, anglers will always like to keep kind of the hot tip and to kind of have the upper edge on a lot of these fisheries. So there is a concern that some of the um, specifically top bass locations will be kept under wraps or be kept secret because there is a fear that a new introduction might not um, get reported because people kind of want to keep it to themselves. So anglers are kind of always looking for that uh, hot tip and to catch the biggest ones. So you know, we have to work together as an angling community to really uh, relay why it's important to report these new introductions or where uh, bass are being found, where they haven't been found before, or any invasive species for that matter. So kind of just changing the conversation within the angling community about, yes, it's cool to, you know, maybe go and catch, you know, a record bass, but also we have to understand that this is really a potential harm and a potential threat to a lot of our native species. So, you know, continuing to report sightings and interactions and not releasing uh, uh, exotic or invasive species into new areas as a sport fish and as a, um, a new fisheries opportunity. So this is a conversation that I think is really important, one that has to be brought up and continued to uh, be discussed within the angling community. And as a British Columbian angler, you know, just being a, na a native species advocate and really fighting for our native fish populations that already have a lot of stressors on them. So what can be done and what should be done um, moving forward, obviously reporting. And this is once again, one thing um, as part of the angling community that I really want to get out. This has to be reported and these kinds of interactions with these fish really do have to continue to become um, something that is understood as being harmful. And even if you're fishing for them and you continue to fish for them, it is something that has to be um, seen as being a problem and not as necessarily a um, something that should be kept under wraps so people can continue to fish for bass and keep those big ones and not tell anybody about it. So a couple ways um, uh, invasive species can be reported online or through the toll free number. Uh, and it is recommended that you write down when and where you see these new species, what time of year, how many, all those things are very important in um, keeping a record of what's going on. Uh, there's a couple programs that have been around for a very long time, clean, drain and dry, uh, cleaning uh, watercraft or um, gear or boots or anything that goes between different waterways is very, very important. Once again, we just saw that very recently with um, the quagga mussels or zebra mussels in BC. And just being um, a responsible uh, boat owner is very key to preventing the spread. Uh, also, the don't let it loose, be a responsible pet owner. Uh, as I said, a lot of introductions can come from people releasing, you know, they don't want to harm uh, their fish or they think that it won't be problem problematic if they release their pets into the wild. But this can be extremely uh, harmful to the environment. And there are places where you can surrender animals and just telling people that, you know, not to just release animals into the wild. You can surrender them or there are 
options for you to get rid of your uh, favorite pet. Uh, if you see anyone releasing invasive species, report it. And just once again, educating um, the angling public about the dangers these species are to our native populations and not to try and create fisheries for the sake of creating fisheries. Uh, it's a difficult toss up um, as the exotic or invasive um, fisheries community grows um, and it's hard to kind of pull people away from that. So as we move forward with our relationship with invasive game fish, uh, we have to ask ourselves how this is going to affect diversity, but how it, how it could also impact or even benefit tourism. It's a delicate balance, but it's important reality that's kind of only managed by a shifting diversity and what's going to happen um, ecologically to our province. So it's it's a difficult conversation, um, but it's something that I think that is very, very um, important in the long run. So just the main takeaway from that is education and moving forward as kind of those nat native species advocates, but also understanding your role as an angler and as a person that loves our native BC populations. So with that, I will end it and I will open the floor to any questions. And I thank all of you for joining me today. Thanks so much, Jill. That was a fabulous presentation. And I love your enthusiasm for the topic too, it was great. Um, we're just at one o'clock. Um, we're gonna take a few questions. There's some in the Q&A box. And um, as I say, we will be emailing the majority of the questions to Jill at the end of the um, presentation and she'll be answering them by email. So we can send those out as well. So we'll stay on till 1.05 just to respect the time. Um, and we'll start um, with the Q&A questions. Uh, for the folks that, uh, just a reminder, drop your questions into the Q&A box, not the chat box. And we'll take a look and uh, see what's in there. All right. So number one, upvoted a question from Emma in the future, could there be a ban on synthetic plastic non-biodegradable baits for angling or is this something that is already implemented? As far as I know, it's not implemented because we there is a lot of plastic baits and, and they don't just exist in the um, in the kind of invasive fish world. Plastic baits have been around for a very, very long time. Uh, and, you know, for steelhead, for trout fishing as well. But that might be a movement forward. I mean, we still don't understand um, a lot of what's going on in terms of what happens when these plastic baits get out into the environment and how long it takes for them to degrade. I don't see a full on ban of plastic baits in the near future, but that might be something that has to be considered because essentially if you're fishing with plastic baits and you lose it and it comes off there, it, you know, you're throwing plastic into the environment. So maybe there needs to be a shift in how, um, uh, you know, uh, I guess, uh, tackle is um, created and maybe a shift towards getting some more biodegradable baits, but it is does not exist at the time. And, but maybe that is another movement forward to how we can kind of reduce harm on some of our fisheries for sure. Awesome, thanks for that. Question from Jacqueline, do you think it's feasible to establish a cultural shift that favors sport fishing for native species versus the introduced fish species? so that guides and the recreational industry can still be successful without encouraging invasive species sport fishing. Yeah, I mean, I think that that does, you know, it. most of our sport fishing and most of the fishing that does occur here is obviously for native fisheries. Um, and I, I, I don't know if there would be maybe um, incentives that you could do for promoting native fisheries. I think um, as an angler and the nature of the angling, um, kind of community is you always want to go and try to chase something new and something different. But I think, you know, realizing that the impacts that they have in these conversations can kind of shift that maybe a little bit more. And that's kind of what the presentation is about in a lot of ways is just understanding that, yes, these are here, but maybe we have to look about, look at them from a different perspective. So the it, it is hard because there are people that, you know, do make a living off this and to tell those people that maybe their um, guiding operation is, you know, you know, harming um, native populations because they are targeting um, non native populations because becomes a bit of a delicate balance for those people that have, um, you know, that's their livelihood. So 
it, once again, that's really hard question to ask. And it's a hard kind of question to answer as well, because for many of these populations, they're already established. So, mm -hmm. but the bulk of our, you know, our guiding operations and our fisheries here in BC are for native populations, definitely. All right. Let's squeeze one more question in. Is there anything that can be done with the live fish sales at some markets? And is this how the oriental weather fish came into the province? Audrey said she which, witnessed snake fish at markets after the snake fish was released into Burnaby Lake. Yeah, I'm not sure um, specifically on what the, uh, what the um, regulation would be on selling like a, li a live fish at a market. I know um, like in BC, you can't use um, like live bait fish here, um, like as a, as a, uh, like a fishing lure or anything like that, but you can buy them in market. So there is the potential for that. I don't know what the legality would be on, um, on uh, like selling of live fish and stuff like that. It's hard once again, because if that's a food or, um, uh, consumer product, you know, it's hard to understand that that can somehow get into the fisheries realm as well. But I do agree. I think for something like that, for the oriental weather fish or for the snakehead specifically, um, just the fact that those can pose a threat and even the, the off chance that those could get out should maybe be a consideration made for some of those live markets. But once again, I'm, I don't know. Uh, the oriental weather fish, I'm not 100% sure how they got um, introduced um, specifically, but I could certainly find that out for sure. My friend who took that photo of the weather fish, he, he works in consulting and he, um, he said that they're finding quite a few of them. So I could find that out for sure. That would be great, Jill. Um, we've run out of time for questions, but uh, folks, the, the questions in the box, we will be sending them to Jill and she'll be answering them. Um, so, so hang on for those. And, um, and Jill, on behalf of the ISCBC and everybody that's listening, I really want to thank you so much again for your presentation, for your expertise, and for your enthusiasm today. We'll be sending all of you, um, attend all the attendees, a link to a short survey. Please take a moment to complete it and give us some feedback on the webinar and give us some ideas for future ones you'd like to see. If you enjoyed the webinar, please consider supporting ISCBC's work by joining us as a member. Members are offered discounts on paid events and training courses, among other benefits. Please visit our website, bcinvasive.ca, to learn more. And if you live in BC and you'd like to make an impact on your, your community and are between the ages of 15 to 30, we have a fabulous volunteer program right across the province. Um, Brittany's going to drop that link into the chat box, um, and we'd love to see some more volunteers helping out with everything from fish to crabs to um, hornets. So thanks again, Jill. Fabulous presentation. Really enjoyed it. And uh, I see your information and your contact uh, details are on the screen. Thanks everybody for joining and um, have a great rest of the day. See you next time.